Hello and welcome to episode 9 of the Huddersfield Town Social. And one after yet another defeat. Now 270 minutes without a goal for Huddersfield Town this season and, and two league defeats on the bounce. My name's Greg Mara. As ever joining me is Cameron Pope, Ian Kilroy and Gaz Kay on his iPad. Three goals in the second half against Brentford, which marked uh, kind of what we kind of knew about Huddersfield Town going into that game. We didn't really expect anything else. I think most of us in our predictions last week said a defeat. We'd maybe created a little bit more, given the fact we had decent amounts of possession and, and, and that going forward against Norwich. But... Um, yeah, Brentford seemed to be a cut above and, and Town seemed to be absolutely, completely different, especially when Schindler and Topolo went off. Gents, how did you see it? Well, boys, my take on uh, another tepid weekend, um, another tepid performance from Huddersfield Town, OK? I, I think I want to highlight this through a word that Carlos Corbidan and his Spanish contingent will be very familiar with, OK? It's called Ojalá. Okay, and it comes from um, from when Spain was overrun by the Moors and the Arabs. Um, it comes from or oh, Allah, and it literally means hopefully. Okay, and, and you can use it in certain phrases like this, like "Ojalá que haga soloy," I hope it's sunny today, or "Ojalá que salga bien," I hope it turns out okay. Or you can also use it like "Ojalá que Phil y el transfer committee se rasquen los posibles para reemplazar a Callum Grant y Aston Mas porque estamos aburriéndonos de este puta estilo de juego joder hoy, tío. Lads, this is not good enough, okay? As you said, this is three games this season where okay we haven't scored, we haven't looked like scoring. This was 90 minutes of dross, okay? Behind me, um, in the spare room, I've got a couple of pillows, okay? The fodder that fluffs them will be more interesting to stare at for 90 minutes than that on Saturday, okay? And I'm not saying that it's lack of effort, okay? I'm sure that everyone on that field, most on that field, have Huddersfield Town at heart. But this is getting seriously, seriously difficult to watch now. At what point during that 90 minutes do we have any bite? We don't even have the bark anymore. We were just uh, several tiers below now. And I know, okay, you can look at teams like Norwich, teams like Brentford. Where are we going to be competing with them? We were at the end of last season. We, like, Norwich were a league above us. We're not going to be competing with them this season. It's unlikely. Perhaps we should, but that's a different argument. However, you expect to give it a go. I don't know who we could beat at the moment. You know, dog and duck reserves would probably give us a good game. Like, I'm glad, you know, we didn't end up playing Golker because they probably would have turned us over as well. And that's no disrespect to them. It's terrible. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm blown away by that, that use of Spanish. I have no idea what you said. I've just Googled, apparently Spanish for garbage is basura, which is, which is my complete contribution to the... The Spanish conversation, but I mean, I, yeah, um, I, I know we get a stick for being negative, but when you're more negative than, than Matt Glennon, you know that you, you definitely reached a low point. Um, I, I thought, you know, you look at the stats and certainly half time and full time, the stats flattered us. You know, it looked like we'd actually been in the game and we controlled it. It's clear that part of Carlos, Carlos's defensive mechanism is to try and hold the ball and try and hold the ball and then create some purpose from having that ball. Unfortunately, it just was like the Wagner days where we sort of passed it side to side and then passed it forward into their midfield so they could break and hit us on the, on the run. Yeah, Brentford were probably as, as poor as I've seen them in the last two or three seasons. I think Tony's finding his feet. You know, Watkins and Ben Rahm are always going to be a miss out of a, a championship team. It sounds like Ben Rahm is on his, on his bike. Um, but we, we, we created nothing. Um, we caused them no problems whatsoever. You know, once they scored the first goal, to be honest, it was a job of, it was a case of how many. And I think they probably went, they went soft on us. They could have been two or three up easy at half time, And they never got out of second gear. Um, you know, I, I mean, when you're starting with Mbenza as a number nine, and you know, you're pretty much going to hide into nothing. You know, you looked at that team sheet before the game and you were left scratching your head as to, as to where a goal was going to come from. And I don't think it was a surprise to anybody watching that there were no goals to, to you know, to cheer the, the lowly town fans up at the minute. It's a, it's a poor do, lads, a real poor do. Look, going into this season, we didn't expect loads of transfers because of the communication put out by the club that 
it just, it just, everything seemed that money would be tight, right? We understand that. We might not like it. We might complain about it because of what happened in the Premier League and where that money's gone. But did anyone think it'd get to the point where Ben Amos starting as number one and Ben's is starting as nine, Diakabi's wide at the front three, O'Brien's not there? We're just, it's, the squad is, is not only crap, right, after last year, it's paper thin. We brought in Danny Ward, we knew we were going to be injured half the time. He's injured. Corburn's talking in conferences saying, oh, I don't know if we'll bring any more strikers in. What? We've lost Mounier, Grant's not playing, so we're a striker down for starters, right? Kachunga's now scoring goals in Chef Wednesday. He would have been an option this year. He's not here anymore. There's no strikers anywhere. We're an absolute joke. I don't... I, I never honestly expected it to be so bad so quickly. We're three games in, and I'm turning up now to watch games, and it's like we're playing a team from a high division in the cup. That's what these games feel like. That's what these games remind me of. We're competing, kind of, and we're competing a bit because we're not fully pressing as much as I think he wants under the Cobra and under the Bielsa ball kind of system. This week's key word from the club was murder ball. That's what it was. Oh, we're playing amazing murder ball in training. That's fine, right? But in games, last year, we scored goals from corners. We scored goals from set pieces. That's the only way we could really be creative then. And it's got even worse than that. We've not, caught, we've not scored a goal in three games. We've not scored a goal in three games so far. That's, what? Is that... Has that happened before? I know it's at least 28 years since two league games we've not scored a goal in. But to go, to go so far into, into a season already and not have even scored a goal, or look like scoring a goal, okay, we hit the outside of the post at the weekend from a, from a header at the, again, from a corner, wasn't it? That's exactly where that one came from, um, that hit the post and went wide. But it's just dry, isn't it? There's just nothing there. We've still got Richard Stearman making mistakes for fun in the back line. We could have been 3 0 down at half time. Hamer's passed one to Tony who's been put it wide of the, um, of, of the bottom right-hand side of the post. We're just giving chances away for fun and we can't get anything ourselves. It's just, it's relegation fodder. That's where it is. That's already, unless there's some big changes coming and it, we don't have the money to make the big changes. We're still dilly-dallying on Grant going. Now we've got no communication from the club. No one really knows what's going to happen with transfers. But instead, what we get is we get battered by Brentford 3-0. And before the game, it's pretty clear. Club have thought, do you know what? We might get battered here. So let's hold off on telling everyone about the new signing. Give everyone a bit of pick-up after Brentford. That's what happened on Saturday. We've gone in expecting to get pumped and to make everyone a little bit happier with a nice little exciting signing of a 22-year-old from Ajax. I think he's 22. Um, which is quite exciting, yeah, fair enough. But that kind of undertone of waiting until we get battered to tell us about it just didn't sit well with me either. The entire thing's just off. It's just... I'm not excited to watch games. I'm not, I'm not in England anymore. I've got to watch what I can on TV. Um, and normally I look, I look forward to it. And already it's just like, how much more of this shit have we got to go? How many more games have we got of this before we can actually do something different? And I, and I can't be the only one feeling this way. Going, I mean, we'll get on to that. I thought you said there in a minute. But I just want to, the first two goals, especially, uh, the third is, is a crackerjack from Embuemo. But, I mean, he's a one-footed player and he's been given the opportunity, I think, by Jaden Brown two or three times during that second half to, to, to go on his left foot and, and, and hit the target. And third time looking, it was a cracking finish. But them first two goals, the defence for him. Cam, last week you said their statement's all right, but he got Meg twice, Cam. He got Meg what? twice. That's well, career-ending. I'm going to say, I, I put, I put my, my name, my, 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 my head on the line there, you know, last week saying I went out on a limb to, 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 to back him. And I'm really, I'm eating a very big, healthy slice of humble pie this week. Richard Stearman, you let me down. You let me down, okay? I stuck my, I, I stuck my neck on the line for you. And I was personally hurt when he swung for that ball. And all right, no one can, nobody can question his, his commitment, okay? Nobody can question um, the fact that he cares. It's not a lack of effort. But at the moment, it's either a lack of form or it's deeper than that. It's a lack of ability, okay? There's no way that the way he's played for the last year, since we've had him, there's no way that he should be our first starting centre-half. And okay, I know we're, we're limited as to what we can do while Naby Sar sat in a hotel room somewhere. And... I imagine, you know, we'll see him, we'll see him phased out. But this is how low that confidence has got. And okay, he, he, was, he was poor on Saturday. He was poor. But we can't even single him out because this, 
this the fact that we're so bereft of confidence, you can see it across the whole squad. You can see it in the mistakes that Hamer is making week in, week out that we've touched on. You know, it's like uh, th th there's no there's no belief there. There's, these are basic errors, basic errors that these players, they forge careers in the top two divisions of English football, a lot of them, for, for many years now. Okay, like they, they're better than this. It's not because they are through and through shite. But something, something is clearly missing now. Something is meaning that they are underperforming every single week. Something drastically wrong. Something drastically wrong. And I, I, I just don't, I, I don't, I, I don't see it changing. And this is something I've seen many, many a time brought up in the last couple of days on uh, on social media. Is the fact that you know, again, rather than have a good clear out, we've gone with these broken men who've got us relegated and the ones that have been whose whose confidence, if it wasn't already low, has been belittled even further last season. Okay, these are these are like broken men at times. They don't. Okay, he put he put he put everything on the line last week, and I, I stand by what I said in the wake of that because I thought, okay, that was one of his best games in a town shirt, if not the best. Okay, it's still an absolute clangor that he's dropped. And then this week, to pin out Stearman is unfair, but this is just the example I'm I'm concentrating on. It just it doesn't it doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. And like we say, we're gifting goals away. Okay, and we're not a, we're not a squad that's blessed with goals, are we? So we can't go gifting them away ten a penny. It it, it just won't do. And so I, I I I do feel for him. I feel like this is just every every player has a, a move in their career that doesn't pan out for whatever reason. This one, I'm sure he'll look back on and think, okay, this just did not work out for me. But how many players have we got that are going through that at the moment? That's the thing, isn't it? Like, how how, how long can you go saying, oh, it's not working for these players? Um, the the forms did they don't look mentally there? It's the club that's the issue, not the players. It is. It is something that's just culturally shit, and that's what's gone on there. Um. Stearman is just, he's, he's not there. He's gone, as we know. And, and going into these first few games, I think in our season preview or the first episode we did, we spoke about the most important thing is the resilience of the team. Because for the last two, three years, when the first goal goes in against us, we collapse. We collapse in on ourselves. And that is really difficult to rebuild. I'd say it's the, the hardest thing in football to rebuild because it's all mental. You can't do that on the training ground. You can't, you sometimes need a little bit of luck to try and help you on your way. We've not had that. You do create your own look, and we don't create anything other than, other than um, pretty good set set pieces. And um, have taken. We're pretty good at kickoffs because we we take enough of them. But that resilience is just is just not there. That first goal goes in, and it's just it's just awful, isn't it? Like, as soon as it goes in, you might as well turn it off and just go out. It might, it might, anything, anything, but watch the rest of the game because it's done. We don't have game changes on the bench, and we've never had them. We haven't had them for years. Um, it's just. It's the same as what we've seen before. A new, there's a new coach there, but it, it, it looks like the players have got the same issues um, when it comes to going a goal behind. And until until going a goal behind, we're, we're not we're not too bad. But then that happens, and we've got to attack a little bit more. And there's nothing. Brentford attacking at the weekend on their counter attack for the first goal, I think. Um, they've broken and had four men in the box by the end of it, and we've got one defender in there. Peeper, I don't even know where he is. For I don't know where he is. I think he overlapped on the right going forward and then he was pretty casual getting back. It led to Stearman having to drift out wide. And if you've got Stearman drifting out wide, trying to chase down a winger, it's not going to end very well. On the other side of the field, I don't even know where the defenders... I'd, honestly, if you, if you want to go back and watch the goal, it's, it's an absolute mess. It's okay pressing and pushing more men forward, as Corbin wants to do. But you have to have the players to do it. Sywert tried to come in and play his way initially with the wrong type of players and we got battered week in, week out. And two games in, three games in. I'm not saying Corbin is Sawa. I'm not saying he's the same. I'm not saying he's, he's, he's an awful coach like Sawa appeared, although we all reckon he was hung out to dry. We know that. But persisting with his own system, instead of adapting it to something like the Cowleys had to do to win games and keep us in this division, unless we bring in players quickly and get the grant sale through so we can do that, this season's going to be very similar to last season without being able to be saved in January. And <clears throat> I'm going to show my my uh, my class now, like Cameron, but a different way. Vin, you know, Vince Lombardi once said about you know winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is losing, and that's the problem. You know, seven of the eleven that started, I think it was, were were here last season. So you know that mindset, that that defeatist mindset continues. Um, I'm not a big one for stats, and certainly XG does not for me. But our XG is the worst in the championship and the worst in all four divisions. 
You know, so you don't need to be a rocket scientist to work out what our problem is. We've taken 60-odd percent of the goals out of the team from last season by removing Mounier and Grant. And what's our response to that? We've signed a right-back, promising kid though he is, a centre-half who's played most of his career at League One, uh, a defensive midfielder from Ajax who's, who looks injury-ravaged, but, you know, the boy looks a prospect. But do we really need another number six at the minute? And a striker who spends most of his time on, on, on the physio's couch. So, you know, I just... I, I do feel for Carlos. You know, I, I don't know what promises he was or wasn't made when he signed, but I'm fairly sure I stand by what I said when we found out the Cowleys are gone. I'm fairly sure part of the deal is you got to make do with these lads that you've got, um, and he's going to have to be some coach to get a real tune out of these. Because two or three signings, which is what I think we're going to get, ain't going to be anywhere near enough. If Schindler and Toffolo are out for any length of time, especially Toffolo. We're in a big, you know, we're in a lot of trouble there. Jaden Brown again looked a long way off being a, a championship player. I thought when he came in, I thought he did it. You know, he ran around and he got stuck in, but he added nothing to the game. It just drifted him by. Um, I think somebody who does deserve a bit of credit, I thought, was Romney Critchlow. I thought he looked really nervous when he came on, but he grew into the game a bit. Won a couple of good headers. He brought the ball out a couple of times and tried to, you know, tried to get play going. But you know, the the, the second goal, it was like schoolboy football. You know, he had the, the lad is back to go. Four town players went to him and left the other guy stood completely unmarked, three yards away. That you know, that's the standard that Carlos is trying to work with. We've got a we've got an uphill battle, and you're right. Relegation fodder is definitely uh, where we're going this year. I just can't see anything else. Did on that subject? Did anyone see um, a great stat from Stephen Chicken um, he put on this weekend? Um, to summarise, um, it's not a stat I've ever even looked at before, and this, and it, but it's so it encapsulates the problem we have at the moment. Um, our front six players, so that's not including the back four and a goalkeeper. Um, for their other clubs before they joined us, has got eighty-seven goals in seven hundred and twenty-five games. Yet for us, in four hundred and forty-one games, so roughly half. It's got 13. 13. That's four times less. Four times less, okay? And I know players go up in form, they go down in form, as we've said already. Some players are suited to other clubs, some players might mature, whatever. But four times difference over six players, like over our front six. Four times. There isn't, there, there isn't a more boring club in terms of football to watch in the top 92. And okay, and I say this with a big caveat because there are, there are clubs in far, far worse states, okay? And there's clubs that are no longer clubs, okay? So taking that aside, on the pitch, we have to be down there. I mean, okay, yeah, our XG is the lowest in what, in, in what the 72. I'm not bloody surprised. Last year, Grant so, scored goals from nothing, though. Grant, Grant bagged goals last year from absolutely nothing. He created his own chances and scored goals that he earned himself, right? As of now, I'm just trying to think of the last time Huddersfield Town didn't have an out-and-out number nine. I have a think of it, honestly. I was trying to work back, I think, all the way back to Stead. Before that, I think we had Martin Smith. Before that, we had, no idea, Leon Knight. Before that, the relegation season. Marcus Stewart. Won. How can you not remember Marcus Stewart? Yeah, but in between... Martin in between in between Stewart, in between Stewart and Leon Knight, and I can't remember when in Division One, right? Martin Smith, Wynard. but he was injured. Yeah, and Wynard, and he was injured, wasn't he as well? Because he played a little bit in League One. But since then, I can't remember last time we had no strike, no number out and out number nine playing. Honestly, think it back. Rhodes has played. We've got Wells. We, we've always had a guy who's been our number nine, who was a big strike, a big signing. We don't have it, and, and and that's the worst I can actually ever remember Town being. We're not creating chances and we don't have guys who can, create, who can create chances to score themselves either. And that's just a recipe for disaster. Well, if you, if you take uh, what uh, HCFC Stato on Twitter said, uh, Ben Aimer had 67 touches yesterday and uh, the front three had 74 combined. That says all you need to know. What does Phil Town are playing in our own third and the second third of the pitch? We're not getting into the final third. And we haven't been getting to the final third since we got promoted out of this division uh, over three years ago now. Um, you know, we've not adequately replaced Aaron Moy, we've not ad adequately replaced... Steve Mounier's bag today. You know, as soon as he gets some service, crossed into the box, bang, goal. We've not adequately replaced those that were left. And I don't want to go down the same, same you know... God, I don't want to repeat the same record ever again, because it is a broken record and nobody wants to wear shite recruitment has got us into this position but surely when you're going into a summer 
when you're, you know, the, the three transfer system, uh, three, three transfer windows that were promised, and that's how you're going to turn around the squad. Obviously, that comment was made before the global pandemic, but you needed to turn around players this summer, and you needed to get three or four attackers into the, into the squad, and that's not been done, and it's a travesty because. Assuming Grant Grant goes, you you are going to need two or three attackers. Otherwise, you might as well just admit that we're going to get relegated because without goals, you don't stay up. Well, goals win games, Greg. You know, I know it's it's an old uh, it's an old adage, but never so truer. And, and I, I I still think I'm still convinced that uh, before the pandemic. The decision had already been made. Certainly, it sounds like the, the Cowleys were on the way in February from what we've been told, that we were going to work with what we got. I mean, we we're going to work on a budget and work it a different way and that splashing out on marquee signings and big players wasn't going to be enough, wasn't going to be the way for the field town anymore. We were going to be sustainable. Now, you know, the, the silence from the club continues to be deafening. Mark stuck his head above the parapet, God love him, on Saturday and, and promptly got it blown off by a few fans looking at some of the responses to his tweets. Um, but the one that really got to me, the one that really concerned me, was his his comment about turning down opportunities to have names on the front of the shirt because, in his opinion, they undervalued the return for the investor on that on that piece of business, which I just find bizarre. You know, if we are genuinely in a position where we are, you know, we are hand to mouth, you know, they've run out of cash, so there's no cash coming through the turnstiles. We know all of that. Then why would you turn down? any offer you know we're now in the middle of September so you know a, a, a grade one sponsorship deal paying several hundreds of thousand pounds which is what they'll be aiming for one would guess you know those deals have been and gone you're scrabbling around the bottom now and what we'll probably end up doing is either putting nothing on it or we'll end up putting a charity on it and trying to make out that it's some kind of grand gesture when in reality we've taken the decision that some money that was offered wasn't enough money. I just find it, that's, that's the bit I don't get. You know, if we need money to fund signings and we need money to pay wages, why are we turning down what seem to be offers on the table for pound notes? I think it's even bigger than that as well because we're laying people off. We've made people redundant and yet we, we, we won't accept a shirt sponsorship deal because we don't think it's enough money for a grand old club like Huddersfield Town Football Club. Where is the sense in that? I don't think they quite understand the predicament that we are going to be in either because the, re the reality of the situation is I know people have bought season tickets and they expect to be going back into stadiums at some point this year but you won't have a full stadium this season. It's a global pandemic that where um, it, you know, it's, it's kicking off again. Without a, a vaccine, we ain't going to be going back in anywhere. So you're not going to have the money coming through the turnstiles and you're not going to have your season ticket sales. To turn down any sort of money from companies, even if they deem it to be cut price, we are looking at a depression that hasn't been seen in the world for 300 years. We're looking at millions unemployed when furlough ends. Companies will not, in those positions, go and give big money to football clubs because they've got better things to do. You know, they'll, they'll be scrambling around all the budgets. So you have to take what, what you get. And if they... If, you know, this is this is one for the com new commercial directors to, to, to answer. That commercial director is going to answer why have you turned down these things, especially if the six-figure sums, because a six-figure sum can four or five employees they could have kept their jobs in the club rather than being made redundant. And if people are being made redundant, and these players are still getting paid tens of thousands of pounds a week in some cases. It says everything about that club that we go back to our earlier podcast when we said they've lost touch with the community because if you're making people redundant and you're not looking after your own, then what are you doing as a football club? What are we here for? Because are we just going to exist until a period that we can go, oh, we'll put a little bit of money into it and miraculously hope that we, we sign 10 players? Or do we just go, right, let's do make, make do for now Slap on Cavonia, cough medicine with clout, take hundred grand and crack on. It's free money, isn't it? That's the thing that really gets me with the sponsorship. Like it's money for nothing. There's a little bit of outlay on, of course, on the little iron on sponsor on the shirt and a bit of printing on the sponsor boards for the post pre and post match conferences. But it, effectively, it's money for nothing. Town can sit there saying it's going to devalue it next year. They don't know that. There's no fiscal studies done into that, I'd imagine. I think that's all they're just kind of having a bit of a guess. 
it's just it's just unbelievable. And I hadn't thought of it that way. I hadn't actually realized the um, angle of it could have possibly been used to keep people in jobs. But effectively, it's not a direct co a direct relation, but it, it makes perfect sense to me. The club just, for, for a club a few years ago that prided itself on its yearly winning of a Family Club of the Year award, which was celebrated in the streets of Huddersfield. Um, since then, and, and the community club that we were supposed to be, we now don't have an academy. We're laying people off. We're... We've just, if, and, and again, we, we spoke of this before, all the new people that come in, the way, the way they talk, not their accents, I'm not saying, just the way they speak, it, it just doesn't represent my feelings or what I'm guessing are most fans' feelings, relationship, relationship with the club. It feels like they're aliens. It feels like they're coming in, talking to us about our club as if we don't understand it and that their way is better. Never mind replacing, we haven't replaced Aaron Moy. We haven't replaced Steve Mounier. we are we going to replace a grant? That's the biggest question and issue most fans have. We've not replaced Sean Jarvis because he took so much pressure off the club with his communication. And he wasn't even the communication director, but he helped the club ride the waves when it was just the shit in the fan. He just, he just calmed us down a little bit and, and moderated it really, really well. And like we said, bad deviling coming out this weekend. There's nothing there. And, and there is nothing there because they know the only news they've got to share is bad news. And at the moment, with, the, with what's going on on the pitch, I don't think the fans can take much more of it. The biggest problem Town have is going into the next game. If we lose on Friday, um, or when we lose on Friday, I shouldn't really get into that. Just, if we lose on Friday, it'll get worse. It'll get much worse. Forest have got, there's no points between us. Um, it's it's, it's going to be a huge game for the rest of our season and for the for the toxicity of the fan base. This club's lucky no one's in the stadium. Okay, there's no money there from, from season, or not as many as much money there from season ticket holders, and no one's paying on the day, and no pies and no drinks. But the venom that would be in the stadium this week if, if we don't, if we struggle, if we don't score again, or, or if, we, if we get beaten, beaten comfortably again, it'd be awful. It would be, it'd be horrendous. So the club's got away with one there. Every decision the club seems to make at the moment is getting battered by fans. But that's because every decision they kind of make looks ridiculous. It's it doesn't make it doesn't, it's hard to make sense sense of, of these decisions. And um, I, I, does anyone have faith in the club to rectify it or, or anytime soon? I don't think I do. I don't think many others do either. I think if if it's anger that's there, then it's you know it still shows that people care. But I I I'm seeing people you know the, the everyone follows their own kind of sound fans on Twitter. The kind of town fans I've always followed, the ones who, you know, are sarcastic and that, they're, they're not even getting angry anymore. They're going on, on nice jaunty walks on a Saturday. They don't care anymore. And when you have that, when that apathy sets in, that is when you end up having five and a half thousand fans on a cold Tuesday night when you're playing Millwall in the fog in League One, back when Andy Ritchie was manager. That's probably when the last time the club was at this point, it's been so low because at the end of the day behavior, but arguably, you know, we were in a better position then than we are now. And my worry from that is, is will people come back in a year or two's time when we can go back into a stadium? And because if we do lose that game and if we end up being in a position like we were when the Cowleys came in last season, was it one point after nine games? I mean, we, us and Stoke were the first clubs to be in that position to have actually stayed up in the league. Uh, it showed a great job the Cowleys and, and Michael O'Neill did. Probably how bad the division was last season as well. And the division's not exactly better with Wickham and, and Rotherham coming up into it. I'd probably say you know, Wigan and Hull were, were much better teams compared to those two. But we were comparatively worse. And it could change us forever and not in a good way. I think you're right, Greg. You know, the apathy is definitely setting in at a time where you can't physically be close to the club because you can't go to the games. Then they should be doing everything they can to keep the fans engaged, keep them excited about what's going on. Um, but instead, we get in virtual silence. If anybody wants a spare minute, go on to Twitter, search for a guy called New Mill Paul and have a read of a thread that he put on around how he feels about Huddersfield at the minute. The guy's not even from Huddersfield, but he fell in love with the club. You know, took his lad and, and all of those things, especially when you've got a son, you go and you, you go as a family and all of that stuff. And it just, it, it really puts into words how I'm starting to feel about it. You know, I think when, you, it's interesting you mentioned Jarvo 
uh, killer because you know I, I don't think we realise how good we had it with him until he's gone. You know that guy faced up. Um, he took a lot of stick. But also, he was really effective for the football club. He generated income. And he wasn't shy about telling people about it. You know, he was very proud of the job he did. And, and, and that, it, at the moment, I feel like a customer, not a fan. Um, you know, Devlin, certainly since Devlin's been around, the club has been a shift. You know, I went to that Fulham Q&A with Phil just after he joined, just before the Fulham game in London last year. And, and I've said this before, you know, I, I was really impressed with Phil. I thought he came across really genuine. He got a bit of stick from a few people about his personal wealth and he didn't rise to it. You know, he was really good that day and I just thought, more of that, please. But since then, there's been virtual silence. You know, the comms are zero. They should be making us feel close. You know, we sign players and, and I think somebody mentioned it last week. You know, announcing signings at 10 o'clock at night and 8 o'clock at night. It's ridiculous, man. We should be much better than that. We should be much more professional. But it does feel like the people who matter the least at the moment are the fans. What really matters are those internally at the club, what they think and how they see it panning out. And they'll deem, they'll you know, they'll share that with us when they deem fit to do so. It's a it's, vicious cycle though. Sorry, Cam. It's, it's a vicious cycle that we are in because in, in the situation where we can't get to games, but without fans in a football club, and I don't think they've quite, <laughs> they've quite grasped that. I know money makes the world go around, but, uh, something Ian said a while back, you know, when, when we were losing that money under Hoyle, uh, you know, and we were still a bottom six budget. So, so when we went up, was it 11 million? We were losing 4 million or something like that a season, which was in the, the FFP thing. That's when we're still getting full sponsorship, full season ticket, full pie, beer money and, and everything. That's not going to come back. So... Unless football as a whole cuts its cloth, and, and I, I can't see a lot of the clubs in the Championship cutting the cloth like we're going to have to, and fans don't come back in the numbers that they expect them to, the budget of this club won't be attainable at this level, and we might even struggle at League One level. So we are in this vicious cycle where something has to change, and that the thing that has to change, the simple thing would be say, oh, it's results have to change. I don't think it's that. I, I think the club has to change. They have to understand the situation that we're in. I don't think they've done that. They've got to understand where the fan base is at. I mean, how many people struggle again with I follow? What are the club doing to really rectify that? It's all right saying it's EFL's problem. It is EFL's problem. But are you actually driving the EFL to improve it? Because people are paying 10 quid a game to watch Dross, but not seeing the first 15, 20 minutes and getting commentary overlaid that's two, three seconds ahead. I didn't bother with I follow because I know it doesn't work. I just listened to Radio Lee, so I didn't watch the game. I watched the extended highlights on Brentford's uh, website. A bit naughty, but I don't care. That's the kind of thing that we, that's going to drive fans. If, if you are showing your intent as a football club to look after your fans, and they're not even doing that. Money does, does drive the club. We know that. But the money comes from the fans. Like you said, that's where, that's where the money comes from. So it might be a short-term win trying to keep them quiet and doing everything business first for the club but long term that'll cost us more and like you said alienating the fans goes on at other clubs we've seen it and we also see what happens to those clubs and where they end up and it's not in the same division they start off with that's for that's for certain and unless they change it and you're right we could win a few games but the 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 undertones it just it just doesn't sit well and Yorkshire folk are pretty outspoken at the best of times they're not going to sit there and accept it and when we started this podcast, we spoke of it then. And at the time, we took a bit of flack for it. We got, we got told that we're too negative. But that's the thing. And that's why I'm convinced it's not a results problem only. Because it was there for everyone to see from the off. Costs were being cut. And I'm not saying that's a fault of the club. But the way in which they're relaying the information of the current actual status of the club isn't fit for purpose and he's going to create more division with a fan base like ours. Dean Oil used to pull out worldies when this happened. It never happened exactly like this current situation. But shit went bad. We had to get rid of managers. He was it was deemed reckless by him when he got rid of Lee Clark. We understood it, but he took he took he took a few pot shots for that and he got it right. But what he used to do, he'd roll out a nice QA. He'd roll out a lovely little QA and everyone would be back on board the Hoyle bus straight away. That don't happen. They don't even do that. And if you can't see that, 
is the easiest possible way to get the fans back on side. What hope is there? Either Phil doesn't trust himself to do it, or he's been told not to do it for whatever reason by somebody else in the club. Because he did them before, and like you say, Gaz, we drank the Kool-Aid a little bit. It was great. Don't even do that anymore. And if you're not taking simple wins like that, what, what hope is there? That, that's, that's my biggest worry. Well, technology exists. He could do it on one of these. You know, the questions can be submitted in advance if he's, if, he, if he's concerned about being ambushed, probably by you and Cameron, to be fair, so I won't blame him. But, you know, it, it, they've got to start doing something. They've got to start communicating with us because, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Greg. I think football's nothing without the fans and the way they're going. When eventually we can get back in a stadium, they're going to be back to four and five and 7,000 crowds in a big ground. And, you know, and if they're cutting costs, listen, you know, I... I understand that there is an element of football, whether we like it or not, where it's a business. And if cutting costs is the right thing to do and they know the numbers I don't, then I have to back them on that. But communicate with us. Tell us that that's the case then. You know, don't, don't let us guess, because that's where we are at the minute. Everything is, is guesswork. Honesty goes a long way. And you can do it. I've been on a couple of Zoom calls where you have an admin who is looking after the call and then puts somebody on the screen to ask the person a question. I was in a kind of a meeting like that two weeks ago. So it is possible. I mean, I've done one for the company I work for uh, last week. So it is possible. So it's, I mean, that's Dave Sykes' job. He's a, he's, he's a director of communication for the Shilltown Football Club now. Communicate with us. We're fans. We're, we're stakeholders. We want, we want to know what's going on. And, and that, the thing is, uh, Mark Lillis always said it, he's like, Huddersfield fans tell you as it is. And at the minute, it's shite. There's very few positives coming out. There's been very few positives for the last two or three years, but, you know, trying to move it on, one of the positives was the, again, wrong time to do, to do announce the signing of Carl Lighting from Ajax on loan. Um, but it, it shows there is some progress being made in, in the transfer market, but is it, is it too little too late? For what it's worth, Carl Eiting, to me, is a football manager wonder kid from a couple of years ago. It's a bit like when we got Congola. I thought, amazing. Cam's probably a bit more clued up on the old signings than anyone here. But good signing, yes. But is it the right position? When I saw, when I saw the whispers that we were going to sign some kid from Ajax and stuff, and I, you know, I, I hadn't heard of Carl, Carl Lighting before uh, he come in. Um, and so I, I thought, okay, I saw midfielder flash up. I thought, oh, great, we've signed the number 10. Because I think behind striker, that's the most important. You know, f- to put it simply, we need a we need a proficient Pritchard. Okay, we need someone who's going to like, who's going to who's going to link up. And then to see that he was, you know, a defensive midfielder, more of a you know a number six. I, I I was surprised at that. I mean, okay, look, I said a couple of weeks ago now we need we need volume. Okay, we need we need quantity, perhaps more than quality. I think we've forsaken the chance of getting too much quality in now. Um, so, you know, I'm pleased that he's coming and, okay, yep, he's a, he's a young lad, um, potential Holland Youth International at every level, to under 20, you know, like, I think, all right, he's had time in the first team, everything. This is, this is, this is optimistic. It, it, it's, it's exciting. Okay, this could work out. But, no, I, I, don't, I feel like the priorities are perhaps wrong. And, okay, look, we might, we might, have, a, we might have a number 10 in the pipeline and this one may have, been, may have been sealed quickly. So I won't speak too quickly on that. Because um, I think they were they were both positions that needed addressing, um, but this isn't gonna this isn't close to solving the biggest problem, you know. This this I, and I, I, I what what Ian said at the start of this podcast resonated with me the the, the manner of the announcement. Um, I don't know. I, 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 in, in this age of you know of, of spin um, in 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 certain aspects of you know like daily life at the moment you know I've, I've, it's something i've seen on, on on the news at 10 you know what i mean it's like I, I i wasn't too impressed with that um i don't know i find it strange that we've been revealing these signings at eight o'clock nine o'clock ten o'clock so yeah i don't know it maybe i'm reading too much into that but it didn't really sit right with me either look you know that could be nothing it just it doesn't seem natural but uh, I, 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 we're, we're missing we're missing the, the key sticking point here we're at the wrong end of the pitch okay in fact, this is probably the, the, the area that needed the least concern. Okay, we've, 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 we've brought in a centre half, but we need a goalkeeper, we need a striker, we need a number 10. 
we probably had enough players in that position. All right, I'm happy to get one more, but I'm hoping this isn't going to be just keep us quiet for a couple of weeks because you know this 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 should be the first of a fair few more. I think it, it, it's clear that Hogg's not playing forward enough. Carlos wants players to go forward. You know when they scored their goal, um, sorry, when Norwich scored their goal, uh, we'd had an attacking throw in in, the, in their attacking third, and we went backwards which then led to the crap back pass, which led to the goal, and he went apoplectic about that. So I, I can imagine Hogg's constant sidewards backwards is driving him slightly insane. So it's no great surprise to me that Johnny Hogg's days at town are probably numbered in the in the current team. And you look at the way... God, I hate keep talking about him, but you look at the way Leeds play, Phillips is pivotal. You know, he picks the ball, he turns and he gets it. And, you know, you can question whether he really is England quality or not. I don't think he is, but... But the boy's effective, and I guess that's what they're looking at with this young lad. But you know, I'm with you, Cam. Centre half, right back, centre, you know, number six. Those wouldn't have been the first three signings I would have expected this transfer window. They would have been the last three. I think it's important to know if this is like one of just three signings, and we went for this over an extra striker or over an extra winger. If it's as well as, I'm all for it, right? Because. The quality in our squad's paper thin. If you go through, if we've got two players for each position, yeah, we kind of do, but they're not necessarily good players. They're just names on a piece of paper. Um, it's one of those high-risk signings, I think. It's a cheap, high-risk one that could pay off. It could be great. If it wasn't high-risk, it wouldn't be at us for starters, let's be honest. He's here because he's had a few injuries in the last couple of years, and that's caused other clubs probably from higher levels than ours to think, oh, hang on, he might not be um, able to to play because it's not age that's an issue in football people can't it is once you get into your late mid to late 30s but it's injuries it's the, it's a toll on your body while you're playing and to be only 22 and to have had so many I think he's had three pretty bad injuries two or three anyway um, depending how reliable uh, transfer marked is but um, it's coming from a league that is discussed as not being as physical either as the championship so it's good. It, it could take a, a bit of time to adjust to our to our level one thing that kind of got me on it is that, again, talking about murder ball, such a high-intensity training, they asked Pakuna if he enjoyed training or if he didn't want to turn up to training because of how hard it was, and he said both. Now, we're bringing a 22-year-old lad in who's struggled with injuries to play in a system that takes extra fitness than most other styles of football does in this division. And that, that is a worry. That seems a little bit contradictory, but if it works out, great. We, this is what a club like us have to do, and I accept that. And, and to be honest, I understand it. You've got to make high-risk signings because that's where the profit is if we have the option to buy and we take him in and it, and it works out fantastic. Um, but we've got that many problems elsewhere that if it's one signing instead of something else, then I'm totally against it. But if we're bringing three, four, five other guys in before the end of the transfer window, then great. He, uh, he, could, be, he could be just what we need. What do we need then? Just, 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 I know we keep saying it. I think we need to see Joel Pereira in that. Uh, Papadomams as they call them at Arts but um, after seeing Ben Neymar's um, well weekly mistake he's never kept a clean sheet for town by the way never ever kept a clean sheet for town which is quite worrying unless you count the time he went off injured and Lerzel had to come off when after about eight minutes was it against Cardiff in the Premier League uh, so that's a worry in itself so I'd like to see Joe Pereira I, I think the back line at the minute will be deemed acceptable but you are now looking at a attacking midfielder and at least two to three attackers with a number nine involved in that aren't you it has to be especially if Carl Ann goes well he's going well I, I was I, I was I was doing um, my game this weekend was was Forest against Cardiff okay it was Cardiff won 2 0 both goals came from Kiefer Moore Okay, Kiefer Moore signed from, from Wigan this this summer he was signed for a shade under two million pounds okay that's not that. That is good money for a championship signing. Okay, that is good money. And I tell you what, Cardiff are probably laughing all the way to the bank because they've offloaded Danny Ward, who's already injured for us, and they've got Kiefer Moore in. Kiefer Moore, who scored two goals in forty-five minutes. That, that's two more than we've scored all season. So uh, for me, okay, maybe a striker isn't even. Maybe that's the one you, you notice the most. But if you can't get service up to him, as we've seen in recent years, okay, it's not as important. But Okay, they are expensive players, right? And Ian's made this point time and time and time again, and we're holding out on this grant deal to go through. Okay, and, and if this is the way it is, if, if we're, you know, as, as, as has been quoted, if we're holding out for the right offer, etc. I mean, if this is a case of a couple of million pounds, like that, that's not going to be worth anything in a few weeks. The, the, the pickings get slimmer and the prices just get higher. 
And so like, we've made this point on here time and time and time again now. And so that for me is, is the sticking point. We, we're getting rid of all the goals from our squad. Callum Grant, okay, he's, he's probably on his way out now. And if he does, is, is he going to want to be here if he, if he does stay? So that has to be, surely, we don't want to ship him off in a week and have, you know, days left to go and find a replacement. And I, so, I, I, okay, I don't know what's in the pipeline. I'd, uh, I'd, 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 I'd love to, but I don't. And so I, I can only hope that they're in discussions, that they're, that they're planning, they're looking for it. But I really don't want to hear that we're not replacing because that just doesn't make any logical sense. We're getting rid of, like Ian said, he's, he's, brought in, he's brought all our goals from nothing. We're shipping him off and not bringing anyone in. Well, we weren't exactly blessed in front of goal to begin with. So for me, that's the biggest cause for concern. But then it's not just a case of needing one per position either. As you said, Greg, you know, we need several players who can who can top up that end of the pitch. Because we've seen now, especially, you know, at the other end of the pitch, just how thinly we're spread. Schindler's, you know, looks like that's going to be more than just, you know, a little couple of days out of training. If that is a hamstring, Toffolo with his injury. Lewis O'Brien coming back from injury as well. You know, we're, we're like spread very, very thin at the moment. If that happens up top as well, what are we going to do? Has there been an update on either Toffolo or Schindler? I've not seen anything after the game. No, it'll be a week. We think it might be two weeks. They're going for a scan. I've not seen anything. Have you, Cam? No, I haven't seen anything come up. I haven't seen... Uh, I, was, I was looking at, and to be fair, something might have slipped through in the last couple of hours while I was working, but but no, I, I'm I'm only going off, you know, the way it looked on, on Saturday, and, and, and I'd love to be proved wrong and see that, okay, it's just a precaution, but it, it, to, to haul two players off before 45 minutes, you know, these are obviously major concerns, so it, it's worrying. Oh, I have to say the top one didn't look great, you know, on the TV, his, his right leg went all the way under, and there was quite a scream from him, it didn't look great. Um, and, you know, keep saying, everybody's assuming Grant's going, but of course our latest mantra is we don't want to undervalue ourselves, do we? So, you know, what happens if, if the, we think that West Brom are undervaluing the value of Carl and Grant and we, and we try and play, the, you know, play them, uh, bluff them and end up they blink first and go and find another target? You know, at the end of the day, they're a Premier League club. They're an attractive proposition for a, a championship striker. Their wage, their wages that they pay to these guys will be decent. So, town want to be careful that it doesn't backfire. But, you know, I, I think we've got Wednesday transfer into ends it a fortnight, two weeks on Monday. So, we've got just under a couple of weeks. But during that time, we've got two key games. So, even if we bring somebody in ne- this week, they'll miss Forest. Bring somebody in next week, they're going to miss the week after. So, you know, we're, we're still staying down the barrel of potentially having four games with the current squad and the current crop of players. Still short of a striker. Um, you know, I think we all know what Danny brings to the squad and I think we were all quite encouraged by that as a, a good squad signing. But, you know, what he is injury prone. He always has been. And Fraser, I think, he's starting to fade. His star is starting to fade. He's getting to that age. We need a number 10. Um, Pritchard, I mean, Pritchard was just awful on Saturday he was a waste of a shirt and it feels like a cheap dig because he seems to be now the uh, the latest scapegoat for town ta- fans love a scapegoat don't they he seems to be the latest scapegoat does, does Pritchard so I don't want to jump on the bandwagon with him but he provides nothing another stat that I saw at the weekend he's played 60 63 games 60 odd games and in that time he scored three and assisted three now I know he played in the Premier League for us but the guy was 10 million quid not good enough. We still need another winger. I think Karoma is showing enough promise that he deserves a run in the first team out wide. Um, you know, if this Pereira is not good enough to play in front of him, then we need another keeper. And I also worry about full-back cover. You know, Jaden Brown came on and he didn't look anywhere near the level we're going to need. So you lose Toff or you lose Pippa and we're going to have problems in full-back. So, you know, there's at least five there just for people who need to start and one for backup. As I think it's easier to I think it's easier um, to list the players that are good enough and the positions that we are finding because you've just listed the entire squad there having issues and um, it's pretty clear the club have gone into this these first couple of games quite difficult they've taken a bit of a gamble here I think and they've gone right let's see what we've got and we'll fill the holes in afterwards but the problem is it's just one massive big black hole of shit in it that's that's where it is it's awful all of it's awful we need so many players for so many different positions and. Uh, the longer you wait, Cam, like you mentioned, the harder it is to bring players in if they're already attached to clubs. Prices go up because they don't have time to reinvest because not all clubs wait right until the last minute to reinvest because they understand it. 
they understand prices go up the longer you wait, the closer you get to the end of the, the transfer window. West Brom are in no rush to sign him. We're in the rush to sell him. That is, our season depends more on him leaving than West Brom's does on Grant arriving. That's where we're getting all that mixed up. Um, but I think we're happy enough to wait because we'll be looking at free transfers again. And the longer you wait on free transfers, the lower salary demands can be for players. There are players still available. You've got Luke Garbutt available if you want a little bit of cover. I wouldn't have said no to Butterfield coming back doing a job for a year. He wasn't necessarily great at Luton, but we know he can create things. Um, you've got Mark Pugh, who's been great at Bournemouth for years. He's not necessarily not young, so doesn't really fit into the style that we're after at the moment. The Rudy Gisteed. Um, Mandes Lang got released the other day for something that seemed, must be pretty dodgy, so maybe he's not a place to go. Jordan I's been linked with Derby. He'd do a job here. Andre Green, he wouldn't be a bad little option on the wing. Um, you've got Nathan Dyer. We've seen him about 50,000 times. I like Jackson Irvine. I thought he did a really... He's, he's always... He's a little Aussie. Well, not a little Aussie. He's pretty tall, but he's done a decent job at Hull last year, and I think the year before that he was okay as well. But these are just all options that it gives a little bit of quality. These are the type of, type of guys the Cowleys brought in straight away to try and save our season last year. It worked and we stayed up. It's not the system Town want to do, so I don't really have much hope in that they'll be the guys to come in. I think we'll be going for more people that are unheard of. We've never really heard of them before. But there's just so, <laughs> so many holes. Um, but yeah, you're right, guys. It's, it's time to look for scapegoats. In it. Everyone's getting the pitchforks out already. Everyone's, everyone's going around looking for the newest one. Heyman has been safe so far, three games in. I'm pretty amazed that it's lasted so long. But um, I think Pritchard's the one we're getting this time, isn't it? I was just going to say that, you know, you're right, and I think it will be lots of people we've never heard of. And all we're doing is laying more gambles on top of more gambles on top of more gambles. You know, I, I was underwhelmed with Saar, but, you know, I can see why we signed him. The guy's played in England, he understands the game. You know, he's got the physical kind of presence you need for the championship. We brought this young lad from Ajax, absolutely no clue whether he's going to be any good. I have a feeling we're going to get another four or five gambles on top and you know those gambles will either prove out to be brilliant gambles and keep us in the league or we'll sink like a sink like a, a, a rock with that trace uh, it's enough of us I, mean, I would ask predictions for Forest, but we're all going to say Forest are going to win because we um we're all miserable sods so uh we put something out on the old twitter sphere in my old student radio days we'd have a jingle at this point but um we don't have that kind of money unfortunately, or time. Um, so just a few things that, are, that have come in. Um, I'm not going to ask the question about your dad, Cam, because that's just uh, unfortunate and a terrible dig by Ian there. But no, your dad isn't a Leeds fan, despite appearing so on, on social media. Um, do, you want, do you want to clarify that for us as well? Uh, yeah, yeah, much appreciated for the opportunity. Uh, <laughs> I can confirm. Um, I can confirm that Adam Pope is first and foremost and only an Everton football club fan. I must be enjoying this weekend, top of the Premier League. Indeed. I remember those days three years ago. Uh, something. Thank you very much, Mark Whitaker, who's mentioned that um, it's not great at the moment, but the teams that we are losing against Norwich and Brentford are going to be up there. Um, uh, my issue with, with that kind of comment is that season starts next... We go back two years ago to that season starts next week. I, I, it, 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 it's more palatable when you're in the Premier League when you're playing Chelsea and Manchester United. Or Manchester City, should I say. Um, but it's not very palatable when you're playing Brentford, who we took four points off last season. And Norwich, who didn't look particularly great in that first game in the season. And... And, uh, you know, I think they, they were there for the taking had we not gifted them a lot of chances. So, personally speaking, I don't like that mentality because the, in the Championship, anything can happen. Nah, so someone, someone put on down at the mat, somebody um, wrote something pretty similar and the response to it was, um, OK, can you just let us know when the games we can win are coming up? Because we could just target those ones and not even bother with the ones we can't. The Championship is known as being the difficult this division to get in and out of in the world because of how competitive it is from top to bottom or from top to 23rd this year if we carry on going our way. Um, they are teams that are likely to be at the top of the, top of, top of the division, but we were supposed to be that last year and we weren't. So you don't really know after one, get after one or two games. Um, Friday's a big one, as we said. Forest is massive because they are down with us in, in the doldrums. Um, but let's just hope we can have a few minus 12 points given out this year to, to give us a little bit of a boost to, to help us in the old relegation battle because it's probably easier to expect that than it is to expect goals at this rate. 
I don't think the minus twelve is going to help us. Wednesday will be on three points before we are anyway. So I don't think yeah, we, we should. We should. We should. Um, we should have a sweepstake <laughs> on when they'll go above. When will Chef Wednesday? <laughs> when will Chef Wednesday end up above us? I'd say yeah, uh, what I, November at this rate. Listen, there's an element of a, a truth in what. Uh, sorry, was it Neil or Mark? I forgot. I forgot what name he said. I'm getting to that age where I don't remember stuff. Full on, Greg. Sorry, but you know, I, there's an element of truth. I, you know, the, the, these are two really good teams, and there'll be two teams that are there or thereabouts. Tell me that Norwich were the Norwich that we played in, even with the year they got promoted, and uh, the year before we got promoted. And also, I said Brentford missed. You know, they missed loads of chances. You know, we could have seen with a bit of quality, we could have seen that game out for a point. So, I, it's the, the down at the mat response is a, is a really good one. I shall type that into a tweet and save it for later when somebody comes out with it again. And it's not the results. It's not the results that are the issue. It's more the performances and the lack of creating goals. It's not the games on their own that are the issue. It's seeing the problems we've seen for three years still be there under a new system. I think that's that's the worry. Not necessarily the results, because like you say, it doesn't really matter losing to Norwich and, and Brentford. Who really cares? It won't decide our season. But the issues we can see within those games are likely to stay with us for the rest of the season. I think that's what we're all having a good whinge at, not necessarily the, the defeats. Sorry, Greg. We're into like the fourth season now of, of, of not scoring goals. And we've said it's different when you're playing against Manchester City. But we're not. We're playing against Norwich City, and and we still can't score. And so you know, if we got beaten by these teams, who okay, in all likelihood would turn us over this season because they on paper are better than us. If we'd lost three one and we create some chances, or even if he hadn't scored and yet we actually looked threatening, and and keeper just I just had a, a, a great day out, then we wouldn't have half as much grievances as we do now. But exactly, we've been playing like. It was definitely we used this quote last time, last week, isn't it? Insanity is is doing the same thing over and over and over again, and and it's but it's just a repeat performance every time, and that's the that's the sticking point for all of us, and that's why we're all so fed up. It just reminds me of when David Wagner came in, uh, in that first two games where we lost to Middlesbrough and 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 Chef Wednesday. You saw immediate impact, and the players built their confidence on top of that. Under under Carlos, I don't think we've seen that, and that's largely down to the playing squad, not the playing style. Um, and I don't think I think we've mentioned it. Like Johnny Og, Johnny Og suits that kind of German way of playing because and he had the the offset of playing against a proper playmaker next to him. His limitations don't go well under the system, and and I'm quite surprised that we he was out of contract at the end of last season. We could have actually let him go. And I'm I'm surprised that he he didn't join a few more in, in disappearing like uh, Kachunga did anyway. Don't want to dwell on that for too long. Um, Phil has got a pasty. We've we've said it already, but uh, this came in. Um, <laughs> would you buy a house if you couldn't afford the repairs? Which um, I think is a, a it's a harsh comment because I think we've we've gone over this before. You know, Phil's certainly got enough money to to keep the well. Beforehand, we, we, you know, the Dean Oil method of being in the championship, take a small hit every season. But I, I don't think a, a lot of people could afford to dip in the, the toe into football, man, football management at the minute of a club because of the way the economy is. I think that's a bit of a harsh comment, isn't it? No, oh, look, business, oh, yeah. businessmen are competitive. Businessmen are competitive. And for Phil, He's looking at town not only as a fan but as a businessman. He wants to do better than Dean Arnold. He, he wants the club. I'd take the club. I'd, I'd take. I think any of us, if you're offered the club that you've loved for your entire life, you'd take it for no matter what. Like, like I can't blame Phil for taking it on because I'd do the same even if I didn't have the money to put in. The thing is, we don't know if Phil's got the money to put in yet. We haven't seen the accounts. We don't know what's going on. We don't know how dire the situation is. Maybe Phil's already propped the club up. We don't know because they don't tell us. Right? We've got issues with that. We shouldn't need to fix the house up. This shouldn't be the situation that we're facing. The house should be beautiful. The house should be a £20 million training facility, not a green porter cabin with a, a nice little disabled parking space. <laughs> that's all we know. That's all we've seen. That's all we've seen of the house and um, a squad that's, that's paper thin. It's too early to know for sure. Or to, it's, it's not fair to necessarily comment on the money that Phil has or hasn't put in because we're not sure on what it is just yet. But... Um, to be honest, if, if I was given the option to take the club and I've got no money, I'd take it in a second and I think most of us would. So I can't blame Phil for wanting to take it on regardless of how much money he can or cannot put into it. No, nope, same. I, I can't. I can't. I, I, you know, if I feel that 
the running the club or that I perceive running the club is 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 is, is wrong or, or mistaken, then you know we, we voice it. I think that we voice it um, in a balanced way on here. Uh, but I, I could never, I could never lay him to him for that. Okay, he is a fan. He wants the best for this club. Okay, his vision for what might be different, what might be best for this club, is perhaps quite different to our own. But as for like the whole like you know Potter's accusation, I wouldn't mind being a few quid <laughs> behind him. So uh, I mean, like no, I. I, I, I I imagine it's a tongue, tongue in cheek comment, but no, I could never really begrudge him for, for for taking it on. Everyone goes into this project believing that they can turn the club, they can they can leave the club in a better state than when they found it, and he he may well do. Um, he, he he may well do. So no, for me, I, I'm I'm in, I'm in the same boat there. I, I can't I can't really, uh, I wouldn't call him out for that. No. Yeah, I think that answers a, another question that came in. Is it Phil's fault? It's not Phil's fault. Um, Kieran, Kieran Maguire does a, a lot of the, the, the kind of stuff on Twitter looking at the finances of the football club which uh, went into town a couple, of, it was a couple of weeks ago I think and gave a very good overview and you know we are in the situation that we are in right now because our former chairman took the money he was owed with interest out of the, out of the parachute payments that is what, where we are right now I have issues with that morally um, because I think when you leave something in a worse position that than you found it financially and you claim to be a fan, I think you've let, let the club down, you've let the community down and you let the fans down. Um, that's just my opinion. People won't like my opinion, but I don't give a toss about them. To be quite honest, this, this is what a lot of people feel and you know, a question came in saying, do you think the club is in financial distress? I think, I think football itself is in financial distress. And we should be, I think, we need to, we need, as a fan base, and I'm speaking for everyone, I know I shouldn't, but we need to recognise that, um, you know, a lot of the 200x million that, that we, we went, we brought in has already been spent on, on wages and signings. And it was the parachute payments that, were the, the kind of carrot for the Premier League. That's that's what's left us in this situation. So uh, to that question about being financial distress, I don't think we, we are compared to a lot of other clubs. And look, Macclesfield went bust this week. There are going to be a lot of clubs kind of League Two conference that are going to join them. So I don't think we're that bad yet, are we? I mean, I'm speaking out of turn. Listen, Dean Dean was a ruthless businessman. You don't build a business like he had in 13 years and sell it for that kind of one if you ain't ruthless. So, you know, I, it's no great surprise to me that he's taken the opportunity to take his money out. You know, the talk of foreign investors, maybe they were put off by the thought that Dean was desperate to get his brass back out. Um, you know, and perhaps Phil was was the one show in town. The house met he for, just having to think about it really, I think Phil's bought a house and then suddenly realised the foundations are all falling down and he needs to somehow underpin it. And then as he's gone to have it underpinned, the bloke who was doing his underpinning has gone bust. You know, that, that's the kind of financial pressure Phil's got in. Having said all of that, how are you, Greg? I think our financial position compared to 90% of the championship is an excellent one. We turned a profit last year. We've had strong player sales. You know, they managed to get rid of a lot of big wages in the summer. They're still, they're still lumped up with some, uh, but they managed to get rid of a few. But, you know, I think if we get relegated and the current crop of big earners, the lemons that we seem determined to turn into, into world-class footballers, if they're not gone, we really will be in trouble in League One because paying Dia Carby and Benza and, and Hamer and people like that 20, 30, 40, 50,000 pounds a week, it just, that isn't sustainable. So, you know, staying in the Championship this season, we've got to make sure that, that happens at all cost. I'm not sure when they're at. I know Pritchard's out of contract at the end of this season, so that that would be one. But you look at Sunderland and, and they're the example. Maybe Portsmouth to a less, lesser extent. A lot of the relegation release clauses are only for one, one year, not for two years. Uh, that's why Jack Rodwell. And uh, yeah, is he still at Sheffield United? I don't know, to be quite honest. Um, but uh, he was on, was it 60 grand a week in in, in League One? It, 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 that's That's. To, to Accrington Stanley is probably their weekly budget or something horrible like that. But you know, a lot of this, a lot of the questions. Thank you very much for taking part and, and putting your views across. But I don't, I don't think we're in in a bad situation. And when you 
you know, I, I listen to Five Live quite a bit when I'm working from home these days. I saw a couple of the fans, one was in tears on, on, on the phone in because they have lost their football club. And, and, you know, I think the situation that we're in, we're angry because we, we fear getting relegated and being in a position where we, we're going to struggle for the next 10, 20 years. But I think that always puts it into perspective that it could be worse off. So I think trying to finish on a positive, at least we have a football club to support, even though I follow is terrible. And, and we, that, it'd be nice to be able to, you know, at least sit down and, and watch uh, a bit of decent football with Oggy's commentary than compared to the dross that we have now. But anyway, uh, we've, we've done more than an hour. And it's a Sunday evening and I've got to work at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. So, um, gentlemen, as ever, it's been an absolute pleasure. Gaz, enjoy your beer. Thank you very much for your contributions, Cam and Ian. We will see you next week and hopefully we'll have a point or three. Um, if, if not, I think the melodramatic uh, situation on social media and down at the mat could be a hell of a lot worse. Anyway, until next time, goodbye.